Uh, turn with me in your Bibles uh, back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll start reading at verse 31. So the, Ilis- the Israelites uh, camped on one side, the Philistines on another, and David, uh, young David, has now arrived. Now we'll pick up at verse 31. Uh, it should be 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, one. So 1 Samuel 17, and we'll start reading at verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard... They repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the poor of the lion and from the poor of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And then jumping down to verse 41. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know That the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The The stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharaim as far as Gath and Ekron. Uh, Will you pray with me now? Well, Lord God Almighty, uh, we have just sung together that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And so, Lord, we trust that the words we have just read together are words that were breathed out by you and are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And so, Lord, as we consider your word now, we pray that we might hear your voice speaking to us. We pray that you would minister the grace of the gospel to us 
and that Holy Spirit, you would take us by the hand and lead us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, obviously, the story of David and Goliath is perhaps the most iconic and well-known story in the entire Bible. You won't often hear the name Jesus on the news, but you may well hear the phrase David versus Goliath. In fact, even on Stuff News just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a story of a little New Zealand bookstore that was taking on Amazon in their own David versus Goliath fight. So it's a well-known kind of story. But more than that, it's just a really good story. right? There's a reason that every kid loves it. There's a reason that it makes it into uh, every kid's Bible. It's almost like a coming-of-age adventure. An experienced boy versus veteran soldier giant. Uh, the adults tremble, and the youth steps forward in bold faith. And depending on the retelling or the specific kid's Bible that you're reading, uh, David varies anywhere from kind of a gangly little child to a chiseled uh, Michelangelo David. And Goliath varies anywhere from a slightly tall warrior uh, to kind of a Hulk-like ogre that's anything but human. So it's just a really good story. But what does it actually mean? Now, if this is God's inspired holy word, then what's God actually saying through this great story? How is this story meant to intersect with our lives, our needs, our struggles, kind of the great story of salvation? And often the answer given is something like, uh, you need to fight the Goliaths in your life. And you need to fight the Goliaths in your life, not in your own strength, but with the five smooth stones of love, hope, peace, faith, and courage. And as you do so, you'll know that the battle is the Lord's. I dare to be a David. In fact, in this past week, I came across a Christian book that's all about the story of David and Goliath. And the book was called Fight Your Giant, Attack Your Giants. And this is how the blurb of the book read. It said, are you facing giants? Giants of financial turmoil, fear, job layoff, unruly children. These giants are robbing you of the joy, peace, and happiness that is rightfully yours. Now is the time for you to go after them. Yes, that's right, go after them. You have within you the capacity to attack and conquer these giants once and for all. And attack your giants, you'll gain the giant-slaying insight and perspective of David. David defeated his giant, Goliath, using powerful God-given strategies that you can adopt and use to defeat the giants that are plaguing your life and have kept you from fulfilling your fullest potential. Get ready to attack your giants. Is that what God is saying here? Is that the message God has for us? Well, let's jump into the passage and we'll find out. Uh, The first thing we have in chapter 16 is an unlikely king. So if you were here last week, uh, you'll remember that following three strikes against Saul, uh, God has decisively rejected him from being king over Israel. Israel had asked for a king like the nations, and that's exactly what they got. But now the Lord has promised that he will provide a king after his own heart. And so Samuel the prophet goes down to Bethlehem to anoint a new king. And if you look at verse 1 of chapter 16, the Lord says there, I have provided for myself a king among Jesse's sons. So chapter 16 is going to be all about the Lord providing for his people. Well, after some trepidation, uh, Samuel the prophet goes down to Bethlehem. And as he goes down, there's a lineup of Jesse and his seven sons. And to be completely honest, 
uh, for a bunch of sheep farmers, uh, they're not bad. Particularly the oldest son, Eliab, uh, seems a fairly strong candidate. In fact, his name even means God is my father. He's got a certain kingly stature to him. And so Samuel thinks, surely this must be the one. But notice what God says down in verse 7. Are words that are vital for understanding 1 Samuel, but more than that, vital for understanding God's ways in this world. God says, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. And this is the important bit. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward's appearance, but the Lord sees the heart. You see, God's ways aren't like the world's ways. Our God is interested in hearts. He's not interested in outward strength. He's not interested in kingly stature. No, he's interested in hearts that will humbly submit to him and to his word. And actually, this truth really turns the world on its head. It implies that actually the greats of history are not the ones who make it into history books. It's not the ones who have monuments raised for them or whose name and legacy lives on. No human achievement, uh, human greatness cannot be measured by achievements. For the Lord looks at the heart. And so actually this verse is telling us that a toilet cleaner who cleans those toilets for the glory of God is greater than the next a billionaire entrepreneur who comes across the next big thing. You see, it reminds us that hearts matter because the Lord is looking on the heart. Well, Samuel goes through the lineup, and God's answer is no, 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 no. Finally, there's none left. Samuel inquires, and it turns out Jesse has not seven sons, but eight sons. Now, one is still out in the field, so insignificant he's not even thought worthy to be part of the lineup. Uh, he's the youngest of eight brothers. If you look down at verse 12, uh, you can see that David is a ruddy little fellow. A uh, good word, ruddy. Uh, or as the NASB translation puts it, he is reddish, whatever that happens to mean. But the impression you get from these descriptions is almost baby-faced. Right, baby-faced David. There's no mention of his height or his stature like there was with Saul, uh, he's a pleasant-looking young man, but he's hardly kingly material. But God says, no, this is the one. This young shepherd boy is God's master plan for his people. Not what we would have chosen, but God's ways are not our ways. It's another one of those who-would-have-thought moments that just seem to keep popping up in First Samuel. He is a king of weakness, as we'll come to see. And if you look down in verse 13, uh, David is then anointed with oil, just like Saul was, but particularly notice that he's anointed with oil in the midst of his brothers. Now, in a family, uh, there's a pecking order. And in a family with eight brothers, there is a definite pecking order. And if you are the youngest of eight... You're at the bottom of the pecking order. You are the lowest point on the food chain. And so just thinking about basic human nature, there's no way that his brothers are impressed. In fact, they're anything but impressed. It's almost reminiscent of Joseph. But this is the Lord's choice. The Spirit rushes upon David, just as it had rushed upon Saul. And then in the very next verse, we're told that the Spirit departed from Saul. And if you glance at verse 14 down through the bottom of the chapter, there's kind of a sense of transition here. Up to this point in Samuel, we might have thought that Saul is the main character. But now we see Saul fading to the foreground and uh, to the background and David coming into the center. Uh, Saul is tormented by an, an evil spirit, we're told. And the sense you get is that he's kind of tormented, agitated, disturbed. So one of his servants comes up with the idea, well, why don't we bring in a musician? 
Now, maybe a musician and calm music will just calm your soul a little bit. So they look around, and with great irony, uh, the, sir, the musician they happen to bring in is the very shepherd boy who Samuel has just anointed to take Saul's place. Right? There's a deliberate sense of irony here. In fact, in the book of 1 Samuel as a whole, the very first time you hear the word David is on Saul's lips. Right? There's great irony to that. Uh, so Saul uh, brings him in, and we're told that Saul loved him and took him to be his armor bearer. So firstly, uh, David was commended by the Lord through Samuel, and now David is commended by the very one he's come to replace, Saul. So chapter 16, we've got an unlikely king, and then chapter 17, we've got an unfair battle. At the start of chapter 17, uh, really we move from the domestic terminal uh, to the international. Uh, The Philistines, again, are seeking to invade Israel. They're at a place called Soko, which is on the border of Israel and Philistia. Uh, they're beginning to invade, and so Saul gathers his army and musters to meet them and stop them from invading. But it turns out that the Philistines have a secret weapon, a giant ogre of a man named Goliath. And you might have picked up Uh, In verses 4 to 11, the way that the narrator just pauses and gives us this extensive kind of visual picture of what Goliath is like. He's almost three meters tall, right? Think Steph plus one and a half on top or something like that. He's got a coat of mail that, that weighs about as much as a small adult, He's got a javelin, sword, huge spear, and a shield. Right, the picture is of just this mighty warrior, kind of like an unstoppable force of nature. And he openly defies the hosts of Israel. And you might have picked up as Jim and I read through portions of the chapter that that word defy is particularly important for chapter 17. It's actually used seven times or six times through the chapter. Now, Israel is terrified and trembling before him. Now, providentially, young David is sent to bring food to his older brothers who are part of Saul's army. David hears the taunt uh, of Goliath and he steps forward in bold faith. Uh, his brothers, recognizing his inner greatness, commend him and praise him. No, verse 28, they get angry at him. Arrogant little twit. They probably only came to see some fighting. Go home, look after your sheep. Leave the grown-up business to the grown-ups. Right, it's a pecking order in practice. And if you look down at verse 29, notice how David responds. What have I done now? Was it not but a word? I might be wrong, but that sounds suspiciously like a sulking little brother to me. And if nothing else, it's a reminder that actually David's a real person who is in a real family with real family dynamics, right? The Bible isn't a sanitized fairy tale. It's about real people like you and me. Well, David's brought before Saul, and Saul is understandably somewhat skeptical. But notice that while David is no coward, he recognizes that this isn't primarily about his qualifications. No, this is about what the Lord will do. Look at verse 37. Now the Lord who delivered me from the poor of the lion and from the poor of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Right, just like we've seen a number of times in 1 Samuel, faith and reason look out on the same world, and yet they see two totally different things. One sees an impossible situation, while the other sees the God with whom all things are possible. And so Saul keeps saying, you, and David keeps saying, the Lord. Well, as David walks out towards Goliath, uh, the disparity between them must have been almost laughable. If you imagine yourself there, uh, this giant of a man, 
armed to the teeth, looking every bit the veteran soldier, and a boy shepherd, staff in his hand, sling, shepherd's pouch. Right, it's like turning up to a gunfight with a knife. Odds are not good. The battle commences, and it's over before you know it. Uh, David nails Goliath in the head with a stone and then proceeds to chop off his head. As is quite normal for the Bible, the battle is actually so brief that you blink and you miss it. So is the point, dare to be a David? Fight your Goliaths. Well, there's a few problems with that takeaway. The first problem is that that presumes that this chapter is mainly about David. Notice, and here we want to really dig into what this chapter is really about, notice that throughout the chapter, there's been a marked emphasis that Goliath represents a defiance to God himself. So if you look with me at verse 45, David says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, whom you have defied. Notice, that Goliath is only actually named twice in the passage, verse 4 and then verse 23. Every other time, he's either called the Philistine, this Philistine, or this uncircumcised Philistine. So this isn't primarily about David versus Goliath. This isn't even primarily about a military threat to Israel. No, this is about an open challenge to the glory and reputation of God himself. And so you might have picked up as we read through this that there are deliberate echoes back to chapter 5 where the Ark of the Covenant was housed in the temple of Dagon. Uh, Did you notice that Goliath is from Gath, which is where the temple of Dagon was? Uh, Did you notice in verse 43 that he curses David by his gods? And the main god of the Philistines was Dagon. And chapter 5, the statue of Dagon falls on its face. And now in verse 49, Goliath falls on his face. Now following that, the statue of Dagon then has its head chopped off. And now Goliath also has his head chopped off. Right, it's the same story, the same message, but now being played out not in a temple, but on a battlefield. The real competition in these chapters is not David and Goliath, No, it's between the living God and the false gods of the nations. And so if you look down at verse 46, you can see the true nature of the battle going on. That all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. This is about the glory of God through all the earth. This is about showing that he alone is the one true God. So the first problem with dare to be a David is that this chapter isn't mainly about David. It's mainly about the glory of God. The second problem with dare to be a David is that it presumes you are David and that Goliath is whatever hard things are going on in your life. And I hate to break it to you, but you aren't actually David in this story. You're the Israelites, scared, trembling, hiding behind rocks, as you face an enemy that you can't defeat. And Goliath is not primarily the hard things going on in your life, as real and as meaningful as they are. No, Goliath primarily represents uh, your far greater enemies of sin and of Satan that oppressed you and held you captive and would have ultimately led you all the way to hell. You see, this passage isn't primarily about what you need to do for God. No, this passage is primarily about what God himself has done for you. And so if you look back over chapter 16 and 17 together, God raises up and anoints an unlikely king from Bethlehem who is then filled with the Spirit. This young king comes to face an enemy that is oppressing God's people and that they can't conquer in their own strength. As he does so, even his own brothers don't believe in him, but scorn him. He decisively defeats this enemy, not through obvious strength, but through weakness. And then God's people are delivered and share in his victory. 
Does that sound familiar to you? It probably should sound familiar. Because, of course, a number of hundreds of years later, there'll be another young king also raised up from Bethlehem and also filled with the Holy Spirit. He will come to face the great enemy that God's people cannot defeat in their own strength. He would be mocked, scorned, taunted, and rejected by his own family. He would then go on to defeat this great enemy sin, not through obvious strength, but through supreme weakness, as he died crucified on a wooden cross outside Jerusalem. And as a result of him rising on the third day, God's people in every age would be delivered from the power of sin and share in his eternal victory. You see, the story of David and Goliath isn't about you. It's about Jesus. And so, yes, David and Goliath is a great story, worthy of its place in every kid's Bible. But it's a story with profound meaning, a story that reminds us that actually we too faced a terrifying enemy that we couldn't conquer in our own strength. And God raised up an unlikely king to fight for us, a king who came in weakness and yet conquered in strength. If I wrote a book on David and Goliath, I would call it Jesus Attacked Your Giants. And this is how the blurb to my book would go. It would say, are you facing giants? The giants of sin, which leads to eternal death, of Satan, who afflicts of moral guilt before the living God. These giants are more dangerous than you know, and you cannot defeat them. You don't have within you the capacity to attack and conquer these giants once and for all. And Jesus attacked your giants, are written by J.A. Hislop. You will learn that Jesus is a true giant slayer. Like David, Jesus came in weakness, and he slayed your enemy on your behalf. And so the only God-given strategy for defeating your giants is to believe in the one who has already defeated them. Get ready to believe that Jesus attacked your giants. The message of 1 Samuel 16 and 17 is not primarily be a David. No, it is look to the greater David. It's not fight your giants, but it's rejoice that Jesus has fought your giants for you. And it's not primarily about you, but it's about the glory of God spreading to fill the entire earth. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we do thank you and praise you for the greater David that you have raised up for us. For Lord, we know that apart from the Lord Jesus, we were Israel, facing an enemy we could not defeat, Lord, terrified, afraid, and enslaved. But Lord, we thank you that you sent your own son in love uh, to fight the battle that we could not fight, to die the death that we deserve to die, and to be raised on the third day in power that we might share in his victory. And so Lord, we pray that for each and every one of us here this morning, that we would look to the greater David, that we would rejoice that, Lord Jesus, you have fought our giants and defeated them for us, and that we share in your victory through grace alone. And, Lord, as we now come to celebrate that in the Lord's Supper, we pray that our hearts would overflow with joy. And we pray this through Christ our Saviour. Amen. Are we gonna-